All right, welcome everybody. I can see everybody queuing up here. Uh, happy Thursday. I uh, just wanted to check in with all of you today to talk about wealth transfer stuff. So we always try to do some educational topics and this has been going back for a lot of years, actually for me, uh, 20 years as a financial advisor this year. It's hard to believe that went so fast, first of all. But for a lot of my career, actually, I worked right on the Hewlett Packard campus and we did brown bag presentations, not too unlike this, right? Except we're doing it virtually. You know, about 15% roughly of our clients don't live here uh, in this area. A lot of them have moved other places or maybe we met some other way. But it's kind of funny, you know, it kind of comes back first full circle that people like to be educated. I think people like to understand even if they're using other people like financial advisors or CPAs, estate attorneys, other financial professionals that are in their life, they still like to understand. They still like to be educated on this stuff. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about wealth transfer and we'll give people another minute or so to get signed in. But we've got uh, my associate advisor, Jeremy Bush is actually in the room as well. He's gonna be moderating. So make sure that you locate your questions box and your uh, chat box actually you know, we're going to be monitoring that along the way and if you've got questions certainly let me know um, you can type those in there and along the way either I will answer them along the way or I will make sure that I answer them at the end we do want to keep this to an hour of course uh, because I know a lot of you are dialing in on your lunch hour if you're still working uh, or really even if you're not right you're probably busy <laughs> even if you're a retiree you're probably busy running around doing stuff so we want to respect your time, uh, certainly. Also, want to make sure that you all know that this is being recorded. So oftentimes, we actually have a lot more people that end up watching this after the fact, right? The recorded version of this. So we want to make sure that you've got that opportunity that if you are not available noon mountain time on a Thursday, that you can still go back, listen. Obviously, you might also have other people that you think should have been here, right? If you're listening live, you might want to pass this along to a coworker, to a spouse, to maybe your kids, your grandkids, maybe uh, your parents, right? Depending on the situation, you might have people that you think would be wanting to listen to this and, and learn from this as well. So we've got lots of attendees on right now. Glad you are here. And again, locate the chat box and the questions box along the way so we can interact and certainly I can answer your questions. That's one of the big benefits, of course, of you attending live is the fact that you get to ask questions. And of course, everybody else will benefit from that as well. So uh, thanks for being here again. We'll get started on the actual presentation itself. Where we locate this, by the way, is we put this on our YouTube channel. If you go to our website, keystonefinancial.com, www.keystonefinancial.com, you'll actually see the social media icons in the upper right-hand corner. And you can click on the YouTube link that'll take us to the YouTube channel and you'll see the stuff that we end up posting for clients and for uh, prospective clients, right? Maybe you're just not a client yet and you're gonna be. So uh, definitely plug into that and make sure that you're learning with us along the way as things continue to change in your life. And of course, they also continue to change in the economy, in the world. That's what makes our job fun, right? Because all that stuff is changing every day and we get a plan around it. So uh, we'll get started here. Again, my name is Josh Nelson. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a certified financial planner in the financial planning world. That's the gold standard of financial advisors is the certified financial planners, not only because they uh, had to pass a, a really hard test, right? Uh, that's one thing. You don't get it out of the cereal box. And I hate to say it, but some designations that are out there pretty much come out of a cereal box. It's just kind of paying the fee, taking a really quick quiz or something like that. And all of a sudden, it could make somebody look like they're a financial expert. The CFP is not that way. Not only is it really difficult, uh, there's actually a governing board and there's also ethical and uh, educational requirements leading up to that. On top of that, you actually have to have an experience requirement that even if you were to pass the CFP, you have to have several years of experience as a financial planner before you can actually use the certified financial planner designation. Why do I say that? Because it's really important to understand that there are financial assassins out there. And financial assassins, I think, are, are people that uh, could be actually preying on people, but it also could be people that just are really not qualified to be able to give the quality of advice that you should expect out of somebody who would be your financial planner or financial advisor. So right now I get to be the founder and CEO of Keystone Financial Services. So we've been around for about nine years now. 
And uh, originally, our uh, our infancy was at Hewlett Packard. Actually, it was inside their credit union and on the HP sites. I got to meet a lot of cool people along the way, but also got to work with a lot of people that had very high standards, a lot of engineers and, and people that worked in a, a world that not only had a lot of complexity in it, but a lot of exciting stuff as far as innovation. We got to learn from that as well, um, certainly. And then in the financial world, we get to translate that onto the experience that we give for our clients. So uh, pretty fun stuff. Obviously, you've got on the screen here my email, my phone number, always willing to talk to people. Uh, even if you're an existing client, by the way, we're always happy to talk to kids, coworkers, uh, other family members, your friends, people that maybe they need to talk to somebody for a few minutes. Maybe they're at the point where they're not sure if they've got a good financial plan. Maybe they're not sure if they should be doing it on their own. Maybe they're actually working with an advisor right now and they're not sure if the level of advice that they're getting is is good, you know, or, or good enough for what they really need in their life. So that's our job here is to really be a resource to those people. I'd much rather get on the phone with somebody for five, 10 minutes and help them out versus having to, having somebody make a big mistake, right? Or, or not making the move that they need to move, um, they need to make, right? To be able to take their life forward and, and to be able to make sure that they're protecting against any bad stuff that could be happening. Um, of course, related to decisions that could be made or not made. So really important that we're keeping in touch with people and that we're helping make people's lives better because that's why we all got into this business. So with that, I'm actually gonna turn off my webcam for right now and we'll get into the meat of the presentation. So what we're gonna be talking about today is, is wealth transfer. And the idea behind the wealth tra transfer topic is that you probably have some extra money. My guess is that you probably are to the point where you've figured out that, you know what, we're probably not gonna spend all this money. And so we really wanna think about how are we gonna transfer our wealth either as a gift, it could be done along the way, certainly, but also, you know, at the end, when somebody leaves their wealth, how do we do that in a, a tax efficient manner? So we, we hide the money from the government, you know, legally, obviously, but there are ways to do that. So we want to be using those strategies. But we also want to make sure that it's done in a way that it's really putting the people who are receiving or the charities, if that's the case, but putting them in a position that they're benefiting from it and that we're not actually doing something inadvertently that would put them in a bad situation or uh, you know, certainly put them in a situation where they're vulnerable and don't know what to do. So we're gonna talk about common wealth transfer mistakes, also talk about seven specific tips to successfully transferring wealth. And again, with 20 years of experience, uh, I think I've, I've seen a lot of situations that have worked and a lot of situations that haven't worked. So I do have some ideas for you as far as how do you uh, do what you can anyway on your end to make sure that that goes well. And then certainly about implementation and preserving your legacy. In the end, it's not just about the money, it's also about the, the habits, the values that you pass on as well, and certainly that, uh, that we all do as we move forward. So common wealth transfer mistakes. So this is, is largely the people receiving the assets, and, and this could be you, by the way. You might be somebody who is either receiving wealth or you expect to receive wealth, so it could be that that's you, that you're receiving it. But also think of it on the other end. If you're the one making gifts or passing on wealth to somebody else, it could be kids, it could be other people that you want to benefit, making sure that you know that this is likely to be the case, that these things will be issues for them. So one of those would be uh, spending mindlessly. And I think we've all heard the stories about uh, you know sudden wealth situations, right, where people have won the lottery, or maybe they're a professional athlete that they didn't have any money before and all of a sudden they, they get a big contract and so they're making millions and don't know what to do with it. Or, or maybe it's a situation where it's a celebrity and we could probably list off some people, right? One of them I think is more interesting because uh, I'm a fan of Johnny Depp, actually I like his acting, I like the Pirates movies, but he's made over $750 million dollars in films so far, right, he's, he's still going, but basically it has been on the brink of bankruptcy. I'm not sure if he actually went into bankruptcy, but on the brink of that. And, you know, I, I think we hear about situations like that, or Floyd Mayweather has kind of spent two fortunes, and, you know, he can go back out and, and make a bunch of money really quick with another fight. But I think in a lot of situations, people just don't know how to handle 
wealth because they spend mindlessly. They, they just don't understand that there's a finite amount of money there and it's not gonna last forever if it's not managed well. Uh, number two is going it alone. Yeah, and again, certainly in situations where people receive wealth, really what, what we're talking about is, is people that didn't generate it themselves. So if you're somebody who has wealth that you're gonna be passing on, more than likely it's because you kind of started from nothing. You probably started out putting money into a 401k, accumulating stock, building up a business or a farm or a ranch or something like that. It was probably something that you built up yourself. And so you learned along the way what worked and didn't work. And so you've already got those habits ingrained in you. It's not something that somebody necessarily needs to teach you at this point. But for somebody receiving wealth, whether it be a business uh, like the Broncos, right? Uh, the uh, the family got it got passed on to the kids, right? The the Denver Broncos from Pat Bowlen. Well, we'll see. We'll see how they manage that, right? Uh, if this year's record is anything to show for it, not so good so far. But uh, you know, they they were not the ones that built that team up over decades, uh, you know, like Pat did. So you know, certainly a situation that uh, we'll see what ends up happening, whether they can actually manage that well or not. But I think it's a good metaphor just for other wealth situations when it's received. Oftentimes it is not received by somebody who has a lot of experience handling the money or the business or the ranch or the football team, whatever it is. Uh, number three is acting too quickly. A lot of times you know, people receive wealth and just boom, 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 they, they wanna make a bunch of decisions when again, it, they, they might not actually have experience managing wealth. And of course, there's all kinds of people, including family and friends, there's all kinds of people that want a part of that. Lots of people that would love to manage that money for them or to invest that money for them or to do something else with it, of course, steal it in some situations. So it, it's important to not act too quickly. Becoming paralyzed in the investment process Again, that oftentimes is the case is that everybody under the sun has ideas on how they should invest that money. And then finally providing for family and friends. And I'm sure we all have stories, right, of, of family situations that have gone sideways because mom passed away or dad passed away. And all of a sudden things get really weird, right? Because everybody kind of wants to know, well, what am I gonna get, right? What property am I gonna get? What money am I gonna get? Um, and, and sometimes, of course, uh, distant family, right? People that may not have talked to that person for years may have their hand out and may certainly be going after the people that receive the wealth, trying to, to ask for that money, ask for a piece of it. And sometimes that's hard for people to resist, of course. And, and so oftentimes that is why a lot of wealth ends up going away pretty quickly. So there's actually a, a research on this from Ohio State University that almost 35% of heirs end up seeing a decline or no change in their own personal wealth after receiving an inheritance. So sometimes, again, like I mentioned before, sometimes it can actually be destructive. People end up receiving wealth and it actually puts them in a worse situation than they were before. And again, the statistics on other things like the lottery, uh, most people end up blowing through all the money very quickly. Uh, most people end up blowing through an inheritance very quickly. And again, that's largely because of these five things. So tip number one, uh, talking to your kids. And we say kids, obviously I'll use that as a blanket, but it could be other family members, it could be friends, it could be other people that really are, are gonna start receiving some wealth here, either because you're gonna be gifting it to them or it could be because they're gonna be receiving it down the road. So I think it's important to have some open communication. And that's, again, these are successful tips. Situations where I've seen it go really well is a situation where there's a lot of communication, talking with kids, talking with them about budgeting, investing, planning. And that should start as early as possible. This, this could even be for grandkids. Maybe for those of you who have adult children, it might not even be talking to them. It could be talking to grandkids and helping them start to learn. Now, I, I will tell you that this has changed dramatically since I was in school in that when people graduated from high school or even college, most of the time they had zero education on even how to balance a checkbook. Well, now that's actually part of the curriculum in most uh, high schools, and sometimes even middle schools now are incorporating that into their curriculum as a requirement that there have to be some basic financial skills learned as far as how to save and budget and invest and so forth. 
Now, whether people end up eating that or not, oh, that's different, but at least there are opportunities now versus people left completely to their own devices. So that certainly has helped, but the outcomes that we're seeing are not necessarily changing as far as people's lack of uh, financial results with regard to the amount of cash that they've got for emergencies and to being properly insured and paying down debt and accumulating investments. We're not necessarily seeing that change yet, but at least the opportunity is there. I would just encourage that there's a lot of communication that happens. Uh, I've got a couple teenagers right now, and you might say, well, if they'll listen, right? <laughs> and, and sometimes teenagers don't, certainly, and, and sometimes uh, you know, situations where, where kids or grandkids aren't ready to hear that, but at least start communicating what you're doing. That's what I find most effective as opposed to um, you know, trying to lecture. It could actually be just talking about what your plans are and starting to encourage them to listen to podcasts, read books, certainly to start to educate themselves. And, and stories work really well. Um, stories work really well as far as mistakes that people have made situations like bring up the Johnny Depp thing. I've talked about that with my kids about how, how did you blow through $750 million or Floyd Mayweather, I think it was over $500 million. How do you go through that much money? Well, clearly it's possible. And the interesting thing is that the principles don't necessarily change the more zeros you add on to the end of the number. Uh, really, it, it can go away with tens of thousands. It can go away with hundreds of millions if basic principles aren't learned and adhered to. So really, you know, talk to your, your kids. You don't have to share dollar amounts, by the way. Sometimes I, I think that's why people kind of shy away from that topic because they say, well, that's private. You know, we, we don't want to talk about our money. That's yeah, maybe uncomfortable for you, uh, but really at least bringing up the conversations and talking about concepts, uh, maybe without the actual dollar amounts could end up working for you. So tip number two, um, consider gifting. So a lot of people end up waiting until they die, you know, and then they end up leaving a bunch of money, hopefully, right? They end up leaving a bunch of money. But the reality is, especially if you're working with a financial advisor, financial planner, and if you're doing really good comprehensive planning, there should be a lot of consideration given to projections and really how much wealth that you're likely to accumulate by the time you pass away. So oftentimes it is the case, and certainly for most of our clients they are in this situation, is that they're probably not going to spend all their money. They're probably not going to burn through all of it. And so then the question really comes up, well, do we want to leave a, a bucket of money someday? Uh, you know, when we're hopefully quite old and our kids are probably old, grandkids might even be old, right? Depends on how long you live. Uh, but situations can actually work out well to consider gifting earlier on, possibly when they could actually use it more and that you could be around to guide where that money is going. So, you know, once a gift is given, obviously you can't control how somebody uses it. But certainly if you're there and you're having the conversations, my uh, advice is to just start as early as possible. So even if it's with smaller dollar amounts, they can start to get the hang of really, this is how, how wealth is managed. This is how money is managed. And, and again, talking about mistakes, talking about situations either that you've had personally or that you've seen out there with uh, celebrities or other people with problems with debt and spending and so forth, people will uh, hopefully get those seeds planted and make good decisions with their money. So I can tell you right now, sometimes people wonder about taxes and they're afraid to gift because they're worried about taxes. The good news today is that you can give away and I can give away. We all kind of have the same bucket of money that we can give away. And that amount right now is just over $11 million that you can give to anyone uh, without having to uh, pay any gift taxes or any estate taxes. So that's the good news is that you can kind of give a, a bunch of money away. If you're married, of course, you get double that, $22 million plus. I would hope that there's a lot of people on this call that have that kind of money, right? <laughs> uh, there's obviously not a lot of them. If you're here, that's great. But most of us don't have an estate tax problem. Uh, we're probably not going to end up incurring that tax today. But one thing that could happen in the future, of course, is that the law can get changed at any time. And I can tell you that those limits used to be significantly lower where it was impacting just kind of normal people and it was causing a lot of problems. Uh, obviously, situations you've probably heard of, right, where businesses were forced to be sold, a family businesses, they had to be liquidated or the family farm or ranch 
situations like that where the assets weren't actually liquid liquid and they ended up having to be liquidated upon that person's death. So um, just consider that you've got a lot of money that you could give away right now or that you could leave at the end. Uh, what we call that, it's a little bit of jargon I'll throw out here, but there's something called the unified credit, which means that you've got kind of a coupon and I've got a coupon of $11 million currently. And that means that I can give away that much money either during my lifetime or at my death without anybody having to pay any gift tax or estate tax. So sometimes people will say, well, yeah, but what about, isn't there like an annual gifting limit? There is actually, and the limit right now is $15,000 that you can give anyone, whether they're related to you or not, you can give $15,000 per year without having to apply against that $11 million plus coupon. So a lot of times that's what people try to limit themselves to is the 15K a year, but consider the way that that actually works. So let's say we've got an example where you might have, let's say you're married and you've got one of your kids is also married. Well, you could gift to their spouse, right? You could gift to them. And then of course, because you're married, you can kind of double up, right? And so it could get to be a pretty big chunk of money in that situation. You could give up to 60 grand a year without having to apply it against the, uh, the unified credit, in other words. So what if you go over the amount? Well, if you go over it, you've got to, to file a gift tax return. And the gift tax return is where you basically tell the government, you say, well, we gave more than the, the allowable amount, more than the exclusion. And so we need to report this now because you need to count it against my $11 million credit someday when I die. Um, so that can get recouped if, uh, if I end up having a massive estate and end up leaving over that amount of money. That way they can say, well, you, you kind of used some of it up before. So again, it's called a unified credit because it actually accumulates between either money you've given away at your during your life or at death. So kind of keep that in mind that that's one factor that some people try to kind of manage, right? They, they try to manage how much they're giving away per year because they don't like the idea of accounting towards that lifetime credit. So it could be something that you're doing along the way. You could also be gifting through not just giving them money, but say in situations where you've got minor children like I do, well, you could be gifting money into a college savings plan, like a 529 plan. You could be gifting money into uh, something else, right? If, if they're in college, you could be gifting money to pay for their college education as you go. Uh, you could be giving money for other reasons, right? Once they're adults, you could just be giving them money each year and letting them decide how to use it. Or you could be maybe expressing your wishes and letting them know what your intentions are for how they would spend them. Could also be targeted gifts, could be towards the first vehicle, the first house down payment. So this is just to kind of trigger your, uh, your own brainstorming, right, as far as what you might do with that money. But certainly, once we do get to the planning stage where we figure out that you're probably not gonna use all your money, in other words, you feel very financially secure and you've got the freedom to live your life. If we've got extra money, maybe that makes sense to start gifting when you can actually help them out. And of course, we're always willing to do that. We always are willing to talk to your kids, even if they're not clients, we're obviously going to uh, certainly help them and help direct them on the best use for that money and where they could be targeting it. So it is fun, by the way, uh, we love it when they are clients. So we actually have some families where we're working with three or four generations. And that's a lot of fun because not only uh, is it fun to have that family dynamic, but then we can actually work through all the stuff we're talking about right now in a very practical way because we're working with the whole family and those values that probably built up the wealth in those older generations, those values are getting passed down uh, from the parents and through us, right? Because we're actually working with the kids directly. All right, and reviewing your estate plan. So your estate plan, sometimes people say, well, I don't have enough money to have an estate plan. And the reality is everybody that has stuff, which is all of us, right? We've got something, we at least have personal property, if nothing else, needs an estate plan because that estate plan is really there to deal with our stuff someday when we pass away. So uh, it's important to review this periodically because stuff does change. Not only does the law change, but also your life changes. Oftentimes when people have done estate documents, they actually say, well, yeah, they're 20 years old, 30 years old. So they haven't been looked at in a long time. And once we actually dig out those dusty documents, 
we figure out and people look at it and say, oh, I didn't realize that I had named so and so as my power of attorney or so and so as the personal representative for my estate. I wouldn't want them there. Uh, sometimes people review the beneficiaries. We'll talk about that a bit later about beneficiaries and figure out, oops, I have an ex-spouse uh, or maybe even a deceased spouse. And we've seen that happen before where people just forgot to change it or maybe it was a situation where, uh, yeah, and this happens, right? This is just life, but you know, maybe it was a situation where uh, somebody had named their kids as beneficiaries, but you know, maybe there, there's a weird situation where one of them has a drug problem or something like that. And, and they realize, you know what, that could be really, really destructive for that person to receive a bunch of money without any kind of uh, restrictions or help. So maybe we need to set up a trust or something for that person. So it's important to review your estate plan. Rule of thumb is definitely no later than five years. So every five years, you definitely want to go through the whole thing, read through the documents, check the beneficiaries. Oftentimes beneficiaries will check more often than that, just to make sure because the vast majority of people have way outdated documents and, and there's very likely to have been changes in the middle. Also is good just from a peace of mind standpoint to know uh, whether you're getting on an airplane or a cruise ship or something like that. It's good to know that, hey, my affairs are in order. I know I've reviewed this uh, with my advisor and it is all the way that I would want it to go. Sometimes people also don't want to do an estate plan because they don't want to make the decisions around something that's kind of unpleasant to think about themselves passing away or, or needing end of life care, that sort of thing. What I can tell you is that you will be giving your, your spouse, your kids, whoever you have for loved ones, you'll be giving them a huge gift by doing that planning in advance so they don't have to make those decisions later on um, at a time when they're probably in a very emotional place. So, um, you know, and giving that as a gift, certainly, and then you've got the peace of mind that you know that you've done all the planning that you can to make sure that your wishes are carried out and we keep the government's hands out of it as much as possible. So tip number four, incorporating a grab into your estate plan. And most of the population of uh, this country probably has no idea what a grad is. But what it is, is it's a, is a grantor retained annuity trust. Let me repeat that, a grantor retained annuity trust. So what that is, is it's an estate planning technique that can really help uh, minimize wealth transfer tax liability. In other words, the estate tax. So this is for folks who say, you know what, I think I might have an estate tax problem here. I might have a situation or maybe you know somebody who has a large amount of wealth in excess of that 11 million or $22 million that uh, that could be a problem. And the, the trick is, is that the estate tax rate is really high. So once you hit that, you could end up losing a large percentage of your wealth to that, especially if a lot of the wealth is incorporated into retirement plans then it actually gets double taxed. You're looking at the estate tax plus the income tax on those dollars. So this would be a, a, a method of uh, transferring wealth. So rather than your beneficiaries having to pay estate taxes, you'll pay the taxes when you set up the trust. So what happens is you put the assets into the trust, it goes into an annuity. So you, you have to incorporate an insurance company into the mix here. And then what ends up happening is that you start receiving income off of it. And so when the, uh, the grant term expires, the beneficiary receives the assets tax free. And off, oftentimes the uh, term expiration is when you die, right? But that's when the beneficiary ends up receiving the assets. So what that ends up doing though, is it ends up removing that from your estate. So you've already paid the taxes and don't end up incorporating that in the future. You're just receiving the income. Another type of trust that oftentimes also will be used to remove assets from the estate is a islet or an irrevocable life insurance trust. Now we don't see these set up as much right now. These used to be very, very common when the estate tax exemption was way down in the $750,000 range or even the million dollar range. A lot of people were impacted by the estate tax. And so people would oftentimes take a life insurance policy and they would stick it in a trust. And so they would pay premiums into the policy, into the trust. And what that did is it actually removed that from the person's estate. So the whole idea being that someday when that person passed away, that they would end up leaving a life insurance death benefit that would be tax-free from an income standpoint, it would also be estate tax-free, and it would not count as part of their estate. So it would be a way of removing 
assets and making sure that their loved ones are still taken care of uh, when they pass away. So again, this is not used as often right now because most estates are not larger than $11 million, but it's something to keep in mind if you're finding yourself kind of zoning out right now, you should think about the fact that Congress can change the rules anytime. So those limits could be lowered down in future years. One thing that we should all keep in mind, and this isn't a political statement, it's just reality, is that we've got some debt problems in this country and, and a lot of unfunded stuff like Social Security and Medicare in the future. More than likely, part of the fix for that is going to be revenue. Right? There needs to be more revenue, and oftentimes that comes in, in the form of taxes, right? the government. So they're going to be looking for ways in the future and oftentimes they'll be looking at, at uh, opportunities to uh, you know basically get rid of tax exemptions. There's actually one in Congress right now called the SECURE Act which would actually eliminate the stretch IRA provisions that many of you use in your accounts right now. What the stretch IRA does is it actually lets your non-spouse beneficiaries, so kind of think mom and dad both pass away and the kids get the retirement assets, Right now, they can spread those distributions over their entire life versus under the SECURE Act, if that were to pass. I would guess that uh, it's not going to, by the way. It's probably something that uh, Congress is too busy with other stuff right now. Uh, so the SECURE Act, if it does pass in the future, it actually would mean that your beneficiaries would have to get that paid out over 10 years and pay a lot more taxes because they wouldn't be able to spread out the liability over a lot of years. So kind of keep that in mind. The rules can change at any time. Obviously, that could be pretty frustrating, right? So how do you plan around that? Uh, you plan as you go, right? You, you make the best decisions that you can at the time, but also try to anticipate the future. Another opportunity right now that we're talking to people about is Roth conversions. In other words, prepaying the taxes on your retirement plans and having a tax free in the future, both for beneficiaries and for yourself, if you took those distributions out. So obviously it's very forward looking, right? Because we are at record low income tax rates right now. So uh, a lot of people will say, well, you know, why would we pay the taxes now? Yeah, because we're looking at the future. We think that there's a possibility that those rates could go up and impact you. And it also could impact your beneficiaries. So just keep that in mind. Some of these things that may not seem as relevant right now could be very useful in the future. And of course, if you do have an $11 million plus estate or know somebody who does, have them call us. We're happy to talk to them about how to make this all work for them. So, you know, timing is everything. Uh, when it comes to, to sharing your wealth, it, it's important to think about really how do we want to do this? Do we want to do it in gifting? Do we want to do it at the end? Uh, but also, you know, those discussions, the timing about the, the discussions, really those seeds can be planted really early on. And so, you know, I've been talking, a good example of this, I'll tell you one thing I've been happy with that, that I've done along the way is that I've started talking, probably since the kids could even understand what college was, I've been telling them, well, here's what I've, I've done. I've set aside some money in a college savings plan to cover a certain amount of, of this type of college. So they have an idea. And I actually show them their balances too. When the statement comes, I show them their balances and we'll even talk about, well, here's how much you know, this type of school costs and that type of school costs, and here's how far this money will go, and here's how much you're responsible for. So we, we talk about that, and people can work in college and so forth, and there's different ways to do that. So those conversations, the earlier they start, the better, because then it won't be as awkward someday when you get there. Uh, it gets a lot more awkward, obviously, if, if you wait, and uh, a lot of you can testify to this if you've got elderly parents or elderly relatives that have maybe not shared anything about their financial situation or their health care or anything like that, it can be pretty awkward and sometimes even uh, can start arguments, right, among family members when those topics come up. So the earlier you start, the better. Evaluating life insurance policies. So, you know, I talked about beneficiary designations before, but it's really important to think about what kind of life insurance that you've got and, and what types of assets in general do you have that you'd be leaving to beneficiaries. One benefit of life insurance I'll throw out is the fact that it does pass on income tax free to your beneficiaries. That's the current rule, right? That could always change in the future, but it does pass on income tax free. So sometimes people will have term life policies, which means that you have it for a certain number of years and then it kind of goes away. So other people have permanent life insurance policies 
or sometimes called whole life policies because you keep them for your whole life. And that means that someday the insurance company is going to pay that out, whether you're 40 or 98, when you pass away, that death benefit passes to your beneficiaries tax-free. So that's one thing to think about is, do I really need life insurance for my whole life or not? For people with kids at home, dependents, and people relying on that income, yeah, they, they may need a lot of, of money if somebody were to pass away prematurely to replace that income. So oftentimes what we'll recommend is that people do term life insurance policies and they'll do them for enough money that would replace income for a number of years while their dependents are reliant on that income. But of course, as people get closer to financial independence, right, when you're retired, in theory, you shouldn't need life insurance because you should have enough assets and income from the different sources. And if you have a good financial advisor, of course, you would have done some good planning to make sure that that all should work out without any kind of a death benefit from a life insurance policy. So oftentimes people will drop their, their group life insurance coverage or their term life insurance coverage when they retire simply because they say, we've got enough. I've got enough for me. I've got enough for myself and my spouse. I've got enough for myself, my spouse, and maybe any dependents. And so there shouldn't really need, be a need for life insurance at that point. So the, the reason why you would have a permanent or a whole life insurance policy would really be because you're saying, you know what, I would actually rather my inheritance, part of the inheritance be life insurance and maybe I'll end up using more of the money for other things along the way where I'll actually take it out and spend it from retirement accounts and other places. So it's one thing to explore if you already have a whole life or permanent life insurance policy. It's important to look at it before you get rid of it because typically you would have gotten that years and years ago and most likely less expensive. So getting rid of it, you want to be really careful and make sure that you don't need life insurance going forward before you drop those policies. So beneficiaries, we also talked about beneficiaries and how important it is reviewing those. Now, this is a little bit off the topic, but it gets into estate planning. But I will tell you that it's really important to understand how estate planning works and how the legal mechanisms work to make sure that your money actually goes to the right people at the right time and in the right way, right, from a tax perspective. So let's say that you have a last will and testament. That's probably the most basic estate planning document, which more or less what that document is, is it's just kind of your letter. And you might have an attorney do it. You could use software to generate it. But it's kind of a letter from you to everybody saying, hey, this is what I wanted to have happen. Uh, if I passed away. So it, it can address different things like who should be the guardian of children or uh, what should, how should your assets be handled. It can be very specific in that, hey, I want the antique grandfather clock to go to this nephew uh, in this year, <laughs> right? You could be as specific as you wanted to in there, but that's really the most basic estate planning document to make sure that that's carried out. So that's only for things that actually hit your estate. That's only for things that, that actually hit your probate estate, which means that if you had done some other stuff, like let's say you had made a beneficiary designation on a life insurance policy or named a beneficiary on a retirement fund, or let's say that you had titled something, like uh, you maybe you stuck your, your nephew's name on your checking account so she could help you or, or he could help you pay bills, right? Um, so it, it would basically circumvent your will. It would circumvent what you put in your will because something else took care of it. So kind of think of it this way that you really have to make sure that all these documents are coordinated. So actually the money ends up going where you thought it was going to go, where you wanted it to go, and also in the most tax efficient manner. So you know the SECURE Act, the, the bill that I mentioned before, that would dramatically change how people end up passing assets on because oftentimes people do have substantial portions in 401ks pension plans or traditional IRAs, things that are pre-tax funds, people were kind of planning on that being a major part of their estate planning in that their, their beneficiaries would get it and they would be taxed on it, but at least it would be over a number of years. So when we're, we talk about taxes, it's important to think about prepaying taxes in the form of doing a Roth IRA, doing a conversion in other words, or making contributions to Roth in the first place, whether it's through a 401k or a Roth IRA, um, maybe having a mix of the two, right? I think it's good to have tax diversification going into retirement simply because it's good to have multiple places that you can pull from. 
really what we want is we want to, especially over a multi-decade retirement, we want you to be able to have multiple places we can pull money from simply because we need to be able to adapt to a lot of different presidents and congresses and Supreme Courts and all kinds of stuff that's gonna change along the way. So uh, as those things change, we wanna use the rules to our advantage and do good tax diversification means that we probably have assets in lots of different categories and not all just in one bucket where we're all taxed on them. So keep that in mind. Um, a lot of planning that goes into this stuff and certainly the, the main thing that I want to make sure that I get across here is the importance of reviewing this stuff periodically and making sure that it's communicated, uh, especially with your spouse, right? If you're married, especially with your spouse, that you're on the same page, but also thinking about the other family members that might be impacted or, or friends or whoever else is in your life, making sure that that's uh, coordinated. It does help to have a financial advisor, right? It, it helps to have a financial advisor that you're meeting with on a regular basis that kind of knows the whole situation. It's also important to make sure that your financial advisor is really a financial planner as opposed to just an investment advisor or an insurance agent. Sometimes people that call themselves a financial advisor, they might be more of a specialist, really. They might just be an investment person or an insurance person, and they're not really trained or equipped to be able to handle your entire financial situation. And that's really what we're aiming to do here at, at Keystone is be here for all the areas of your financial life and really put you in the strongest position possible wherever you are in life, whether you're just starting out or you're nearing retirement or, or maybe you're in your later years of retirement, we wanna make sure that you're using the rules to your advantage and also making sure that you're taking care of your loved ones. Really, that's a lot of the process here is making sure that the people that you love and care about are taken care of and they're well planned for. So uh, enough on that, um, You know, as, as far as the tips that we've talked about, really we just kind of scratched the surface right any of these slides that we went through i could spend hours probably right really digging into the nitty-gritty details but of course that's not the point of today that the point of today really is to just surface the issues and really kind of get some concepts and, and some ideas on how you can improve or change your plans and and certainly it could trigger conversations that you'd have with jeremy or i uh, or whoever you're working with right now so with that being said, I will open it up for some Q&A here at the end. Uh, I'll let Jeremy uh, compile questions here on the other end, and I will turn back on my webcam so you can see me. But um, yeah, let's see what we have for questions, if any. By the way, um, for those of you who might have dialed in late, make sure that you type in the chat feature or the questions feature if you've got anything but uh, feel free to throw those out. While those are coming through, I did want to give you a couple of tips. Uh, again, we talked about at the beginning, starting to educate or give really younger people some good resources. And I think for all of us, probably as we were starting out, if we're successful, right, we probably can point down to, to somebody, maybe it was a parent, maybe it was an older coworker or somebody else that was kind of in a mentor role early on. I can tell you for all of our clients that have accumulated significant wealth, they can all give you an answer to that, that it was a coworker, it was a manager, it was a parent, it was somebody early on that gave them some resources and some guidance as they got started. So that's so important for the young people in your life. Uh, make sure that if they're listening, obviously, and you, you uh, might think they're not listening, but I bet they are somewhat listening, right? Um, so plant those seeds, couple of resources to pass them on to, a few books, um, and of course, these are all in audio book format as well, uh, if you like to consume things that way. But uh, Dave Ramsey has a great book for people that are starting out and just want that foundation. It's called The Total Money Makeover. And really, it's a great foundation for budgeting and figuring out how do I get some cash in the bank for emergencies? How do I budget so I'm not laden down with a bunch of debt? How do I get my debt paid off, get financially free? So a lot of good stuff there. Another one that, uh, that is a little bit different tilt on it, David Bach uh, wrote a great book called The Latte Factor. Latte, like L-A-T-T-E, that would be uh, like the coffee, right? I'm not a coffee guy, but The Latte Factor. And the whole point there is that a lot of people, they, they say, you know, I don't have any extra money. And so I don't have enough money to invest. I don't have enough to save for retirement or my kid's college or pay down debt. There's just no extra money in the budget. Well, as you can imagine, uh, Mr. Bach throws it out there and he says, yeah, but do you ever go to Starbucks? How much does that cost? And how much does that multiply out to over a year? 
we probably have a little bit more money than we think in our budgets uh, if we get creative, right? And then another one, uh, Rick Edelman, uh, Rick, R-I-C, uh, Rick, but Edelman, E-D-E-L-M-A-N, I wrote a great book years ago called The Truth About Money, and it's been updated several times, but that one digs into a little bit more nitty gritty detail. It gets into things like, how do I figure out what kind of a mortgage I should apply for for my first home? And uh, you know, how do I figure out, do I contribute to Roth or traditional assets? So I, I, I recommend that, especially if you want bite-sized portions of any kind of a financial topic, it's a great book to be able to either give as a gift or for yourself. So all three of those, um, maybe I should write a book, then I can say, well, you should read my book, right? But uh, right now, we're just gonna have to rely on some of those other experts. So um, any, uh, any, any questions, Jeremy? Uh, we do actually, there's a couple questions I got asked during the um, thing that I responded to, but I right. think it'd be beneficial for everybody to um, hear from. So George asked, uh, how do the feds know that you are within the 11 million lifetime limit? Mm, great question. So the, uh, the answer is um, they may not. That's the truth, right? Is that right now the best tracking that happens is on people's income tax return, right? As far as assets, people giving money to other people, there's not an easy way to track that stuff. So I would never suggest, of course, anybody uh, report things falsely or anything like that. But the reality is it's pretty unlikely, especially with dollar amounts smaller, uh, they'd be more likely to catch stuff that's in the millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars with large estates. They might dig and dig and dig and, and find certain things, but the reality is they probably won't know. So it's kind of an, an on your honor thing, uh, you know, to file that gift tax return. I would guess that the majority of people don't actually end up filing a gift tax return and they were supposed to, right? Uh, if they, uh, a common example would be turning over a business or a ranch or a farm or something like that to the kids or grandkids when the older folks are ready to get out. I think in a lot of circumstances, there's not a formal uh, you know, arrangements made in those cases. So the reality is they probably won't, but if they do, of course, the consequences are, are big, especially if they can prove that you intentionally uh, left it out. So uh, good question though, a lot of times that comes up as far as how do they how do they track that stuff as far as the gifting and if I went over the amount and so forth well chances are they probably won't catch it but that's actually how it's supposed to be reported so we'll leave it at that okay um, the next one was uh, from John do charitable gifts count toward unified credit? oh good question so charitable gifts no you can give as much money as you want to as long as it's a 501c3 uh, so if it's a charitable organization, you can give as much as you want in any given year, and there's no limit. So we're only talking about, for that $15,000 limit, we're only talking about gifts to individuals. And again, it multiplies out. So you can do $15,000 yourself. If you're married, you can both give $15,000. Say if you have one kid, you can give them $30,000. If they're married, it doubles $60,000. So for people who wanted to get really aggressive and if they have lots of people that they want to give money to, you can give a lot of money away pretty quickly without having to file the gift tax return and, and start to dig into that unified credit that we talked about. So good question. Charitable contributions too, as well as individuals. One thing to keep in mind, at least in my mind, as I've been talking about this, I've been kind of thinking cash, right? Well, you just give cash, it's easy. You write a check or transfer the money. In a lot of cases, people may want to give property, they may want to give stock, they may want to give stock to a charity, give stock to an individual. So this isn't an income tax uh, webinar today, but certainly there's implications around that as far as different strategies. Uh, one thing to throw out is donor advised funds. You do still have some time here at the end of the year to open up a donor advised fund and make donations into it, which would be qualified for a charitable contribution. Oftentimes we will find that people will give highly appreciated assets, oftentimes company stock. If they had accumulated company stock, it's a great way to be able to give some money and have a lot of control over how it's dispersed out over the years. So uh, good question. That's a great way to do that. The, the other question sometimes comes up is, is there any way to directly give retirement funds away while I'm alive? So the answer is probably not. The only real exceptions on that or if you die, you can pass retirement funds to another person, or in a divorce situation, you can pass retirement funds to another person. One exception though, is that when you are 70 and a half or older, the current rule is that 
You have to take out required minimum distributions out of your pre-tax retirement funds. But there's an exception right now anyway, and this could go away, right, like anything. But right now you can give up to $100,000 of your required minimum distribution directly to a charity and do it on a tax-free basis. So keep in mind a lot of these things as far as the gifting, it may not be just to individuals. It could be how do we make our charitable contributions more effective and, again, do it in a way that not only do they get the money, but we pay less taxes in the process either now or later. Perfect. Well, you All just right. tackled one for John on the RMDs. All right. Perfect. Um, and then yeah. to let everybody know yeah. that uh, we did put the uh, book information uh, that Josh was oh, talking great. about. We put that in the chat window. Excellent. Uh, in case anybody wants to take a look at those and get those titles and authors. One thing I'll throw out to you too, and you can just email me. It's an easy way to do it just at josh at keystonefinancial.com. But many of you know that we have this key financial data. This is the 2019 version of it. We actually have a PDF version of this. So if anybody would like that, feel free just to shoot me an email and we'll send that back. Just josh at keystonefinancial.com. But that card actually has all the limits we've been talking about with regard to gifting, income taxes, capital gains, limits on retirement contributions. So we, we try to compile that all in one concise format. So either you or if you want to pass it on, especially if you want to forward it to other people, we'll get you the PDF format of that so you can send it on. And of course, in a couple of months, we'll have an updated one that'll show you the 2020 limits. So with, with that, I, I think that's it for today. Again, we are recording this. So you're actually going to have access to this yourself. If you want to watch the replay, it'll be on our YouTube channel, usually later today, usually later the same day. But also, I highly encourage you that if you know of somebody who should get this information for themselves, uh, feel free to pass along that link to the, the YouTube link to the video, as oftentimes that's how we end up meeting people is by referrals, by people passing on our information. And of course, we always work with you, your kids, but also if you can think of coworkers, friends, we really want to just help as many people as possible. And we know it's not a fit for everybody, our service, but we do want to make sure that we're giving them the opportunity and we're pretty good at what we do. So we want to make sure that people don't get stuck with financial assassins. We want to make sure that they get good quality financial advice. So with that, I think that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your business and have a great weekend.